Chapter six of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six An Outlaw probably the great majority of the british public had no idea of the extraordinary situation in the south and west of ireland during nineteen twenty and most likely never will have in the summer of that sinister year when the sinn fein tyranny was at its height an english newspaper sent a lady journalist over to this unfortunate country to find out what really was the matter with us and if possible to give the world yet another solution of the irish question in her first letter this lady quite unnecessarily told her millions of readers that she had never been in ireland before proceeded to relate the peculiarities of the people of dublin and belfast and finished with a vivid description of the peaceful and happy condition of the country in spite of the interested rumours put about to the contrary at the time when this lady journalist was discovering peaceful and happy ireland the power of sinn fein was rapidly passing from the hands of the hot air merchants to the direct action ruffians in other words arthur griffiths became a mere cipher and michael collins the dictator of the south and west and very soon collins had several imitators born in eighteen eighty nine in the highlands of ballyrick Dennis Joyce, after working for a few years as Gilly and General Boy at a shooting lodge near Erinane, drifted to Dublin as a labourer, and at once came under the influence of Connolly, the prince of Irish Bolsheviks. Taken prisoner during the Easter Rebellion of 1916, he was eventually released with other small fry, and in return devoted himself to the extermination of the British Empire in general, and Irish policemen in particular during the spring and summer of nineteen twenty joyce and his numerous bodyguard like an irish chieftain of old lived like fighting cocks hailed as the conquerors of the british army they had shot several unarmed soldiers wherever they went not only did they live free gratis and for nothing but the country people literally fought for the honour of entertaining these heroes a great pity that the lady journalist could not have been present at one of these banquets what copy she could have sent to her editor and the certified net sale would have soared to the skies but though joyce and his merry men had a great time they did not neglect their duty and on every occasion when conditions were all in their favour they shot down police patrols from behind walls and murdered unfortunate policemen when visiting their wives and families however every dog has his day and in the autumn of nineteen twenty when the british army and the auxiliary cadets started to take a hand in the game joyce found himself changed from a popular hero into a hunted outlaw with the usual result that where formerly he had found an open door and a smiling welcome he now was met by a closed door and a scowl and when seeking board and lodging it became necessary to persuade the unwilling hosts with a six-shooter the police and military now commenced paying calls at night and a farmer living in the depths of the country hearing a knock at his door during the long winter's night had always the pleasing excitement of not knowing if he was to have the honour of entertaining some badly wanted gunman a patrol of the r i c a party of auxiliary cadets a military search party or merely a posse of local robbers any of whom might take a sudden dislike to the unfortunate farmer with unpleasant results in the winter of nineteen twenty joyce who would have made an excellent soldier made the bad mistake of mixing up love with war in other words he became greatly enamoured of a girl living in the south and in order to be within reach of her confined his attentions to that district for a considerable time instead of moving about the country with his usual rapidity and the auxiliaries getting an inkling of the situation from a former lover of the girl made a great effort to surround and capture him though he received repeated warnings of the activity of the cadets joyce put off his departure until a day came when word was brought that the place was surrounded by forces of the crown who would close in on the little town that evening joyce at once went to tell molly whose father kept a small hotel in the town and the girl's quick wit soon thought out a plan of escape for her lover 
Five commercial travellers staying in the hotel, and at the time out touring neighbouring villages, had left their heavy cases of samples at the hotel and their railway passes in the safe keeping of the hotel proprietor. That afternoon the train to the west carried Joyce and four of his bodyguard disguised as bagmen. The remainder were left to shift for themselves, and that evening, when the cadets searched the town from attic to cellar, they found that the principal bird had flown. Joyce knew that it would not be safe to travel by train as far as Ballybor, and as soon as he thought that they had cleared the auxiliary cordon, determined to alight at the next stop and continue the journey by car. Just as they were on the point of leaving the train, however, they noticed several cadets waiting by the station exit, so did not get out. Two stations farther on they left the train, and being now outside the net, quickly commandeered a Ford from the local garage, and set out for Ballyrick country, where Joyce had decided to hide and rest for a while. Keeping to by-roads, they made their way westwards at a good rate until it was nearly daylight when, after hiding the car in a wood, they proceeded to search for board and lodging. Shortly they came across a good farmhouse, and after the usual display of pistols, were admitted reluctantly, made a hearty meal, and retired to bed, after ordering their host to have five good bicycles and another meal ready for them as soon as it was dark. It has been mentioned that Joyce had worked as a boy at a shooting lodge near Erinane, and he now conceived the brilliant idea of taking a rest cure there until such time as the police took less interest in him. This lodge, Drumcar by name, belonged to a Connaught squire who had married an Englishwoman, and except for a short time in the summer was only occupied by a caretaker. Situated in one of the wildest parts of the west, a mile from the road, hidden by woods of oak and birch, and overlooking the bay on which Erinane stands, it was probably the last place in Ireland where the police would think of looking for an active gunman, and the chances were that not a single auxiliary even knew that such a place existed. The gunman arrived at Drumcar soon after dawn, and after rousing the terrified caretaker, who lived with his son and daughter in a cottage in the grounds, they settled down to a life of peace and comfort. The girl attended on them, while the old man brought food from Erinane in a donkey cart, and a good supply of poteen from a mountain farm near the mouth of the bay. The lodge was well supplied with turf, contained an excellent library of novels, and Joyce and his men waxed fat with good living and soft lying. But it is a case of once on the run, always on the run, until the inevitable end comes, or the gunman is lucky enough to escape to the States. Now, it is a well-known truth in the West that a mountainy man will always, when sick unto death, homesick, or in dire distress, make for his beloved mountains, no matter what far end of the world he may have drifted to. And when, in due course, Blake learnt through official channels that Joyce had escaped from the southern town, he at once began to keep a sharp lookout for him in the Ballyrick country. But when a fortnight passed and there was no sign of Joyce, nor yet any report of his presence in that part of the country, Blake turned up the man's official record, from which he learnt two interesting facts. First, that Joyce had worked at Drumcar, and secondly, that he had a married sister at Bunretti, a district on the southern border of Blake's country. Blake now turned his attention to the sister's house, and when this proved a blank, he determined to try Drumcar Lodge as a last resort. But at the time of the landing of arms at Erinane, every police barrack and coast guard station within a radius of many miles had been burnt, so that it was impossible to get any news of the place without going there, the nearest barrack in Blake's district being fifty miles away. A travelling circus of auxiliaries happened to be passing through Ballybor, and the leader undertook to investigate the lodge and let Blake know if they found any trace of Joyce. Blake advised them to surround the lodge in the daytime, as owing to the wild and mountainous nature of the country, a night attack would be impossible. On the whole, the gunman treated old Flaherty, the caretaker, and his children well, especially the son Patsy, in the hope that he would join them but luckily for himself the lad had a wholesome dread of firearms. After he had been at the lodge some days, in spite of feeling quite secure, Joyce, with the instinct of the hunted, began to look about for a bolt-hole in case of need. 
though in the midst of the wilds the lodge had serious drawbacks being situated on the side of a slope so that any one leaving the lodge would at once come under observation from several points and moreover an arm of the sea cut off all escape to the north in fact escape seemed very doubtful until by chance patsy mentioned that in a boathouse hidden by trees on the shore of the bay there was a large motor launch which he had learnt to drive the previous summer the next time the old man went to erinane for provisions he brought back with him twenty gallons of petrol duly entered up in his absent master's account and joyce felt easier in his mind on a pouring wet afternoon the five gunmen were playing nap in front of a comfortable turf fire in the drawing-room while old ferrety's daughter brewed poteen punch for them and patsy was reading a novel in an armchair when a long-haired boy dashed in with the news that a large party of auxiliary cadets had rushed through erinane taken two countrymen they had met on the road as guides and were surrounding the lodge from all sides except the sea joyce had launched the motor-boat only the previous day and within a few minutes they were under way heading for the mouth of the bay with the throttle full open seeing the launch in the bay below them as they reached the front of the lodge the cadets opened fire but before they could get on to their target the launch vanished in the thick mist of rain as pursuit was out of the question the auxiliaries drove straight to erinane post office only to find the wires cut they then went on to the nearest town and wired to the naval authorities at queenstown hoping that they might be able to get in touch with a destroyer off the west coast by wireless and so capture joyce at sea joyce knew that the hue and cry would be up and that it would be fatal to land anywhere on the coast near erinane and as the sea was calm he made up his mind to cut across a big bay to the north and make for buntariv a narrow passage between an island and the mainland which would lead them to Trabon Bay, on the shores of which lay his own country. The launch left the slip at Drumcar at 1 p.m., and Joyce made out that at eight miles an hour they ought to reach Buntarev Sound at four o'clock and Trabon Bay at another hour, which would give them plenty of time to land before darkness set in. Unfortunately, when out in the open Atlantic, the engine stopped, and Patsy, who was thoroughly frightened by now, would only sit down and cry. Two of the gunmen knew something of motors, and after nearly two hours discovered that the carburetor was choked with dirt, and it was nearly six o'clock before the sound was within sight. Another quarter of an hour, and they would have been too late. As it was, a destroyer opened fire on them just as they were entering the sound, and they were only saved by the failing light knowing that the destroyer could not follow them and afraid of wrecking the launch in the dark they anchored and waited for the moon to rise and eventually landed on the shore of trebon bay joyce was at last in his own country and before day broke the gunmen were safely lodged in different mountain farms close to joyce's home and the next day patsy was handed over to the local volunteers to be returned to drumcar the following day they took the launch to a bay surrounded by high cliffs where no human being except an odd herd ever went and beat her at the height of the tide on the sandy shore where they left her for future use after a few days at home joyce began to get restless and resolved to visit his married sister in the bunratty district but the local volunteers could only supply them with two bicycles and the distance was too far to walk forty-two miles as the crow flies however he learnt from a postman that a police patrol visited ballyscaddon a small village about sixteen miles east of ballyrick daily and were in the habit of leaving their bicycles outside a public house which they frequented the gunmen spent the night at ballyscaddon and about eleven o'clock a patrol of six r i c arrived in the village left their bicycles outside the public house and went inside to refresh themselves the gunmen who were waiting in the next house quickly cut the tires of one bicycle to ribbons and rode off on the remaining five leaving the unfortunate villagers to bear the brunt of the infuriated policeman's wrath that night joyce and his four men slept in his sister's house in bunratty besides his courage the only redeeming feature about joyce appears to have been his love for his sister as usual she was delighted to see him but by now the other inhabitants would have as soon welcomed the devil himself 
as Joyce, knowing that his progress through the country was blazed by reprisals. Gone were the days when he used to hold audience daily in his sister's house like a king, and men came many miles simply to see the famous Dennis Joyce. Now the country people would avoid him on the road, and not a single person came to see him. His sister warned him repeatedly that it was dangerous to stay any length of time with her, but Joyce seems to have lost heart, or perhaps his Celtic soul had a premonition of coming disaster. At any rate, he refused to go and spent most of this time sitting by the kitchen fire, brooding. Blake soon learnt of Joyce's escape by sea from Drumcar, and feeling sure that sooner or later he would visit his sister before starting operations in the south again, concentrated his attention on that district. To this end he kept his men well away, and at the same time asked for the help of the auxiliary travelling circus, among whom were three cadets who knew Joyce well by sight. One of these cadets, whose personal appearance favoured the disguise, was dressed up as a priest and sent out on a bicycle to spy out the land. After two days he returned with the good news that he had passed the famous gunman on the road at Bunratty, and at once Blake made preparations to surround the place that night. He knew that success entirely depended on maintaining complete secrecy until the house was surrounded, and that if even a whisper of what was in the air got abroad, all chances of capturing Joyce were gone. Tired of seeing operations ruined by well-advertised Crosleys, bristling with rifles, tearing along the main roads, he determined to try and catch this man by cunning. Directly he received the news that Joyce was at Bunratty, he left Ballybor Barracks with four Crosleys, two of R.I.C. and two of Auxiliaries, in the opposite direction to which Bunratty lay, until they came to a small village about ten miles to the north, where there was a large flour mill. Surrounding the mill, the police carried out a perfunctory search, and left just before dark, taking with them two of the miller's lorries, one empty and the other loaded with flour sacks and two large tarpaulins, cutting the wires as soon as they were clear of the village. Making their way eastwards until they reached a long stretch of desolate bog road, they halted with one tender about a quarter of a mile behind and another the same distance ahead. They then proceeded to transfer half the flour sacks to the empty lorry, built them up with a hollow in the middle so that both lorries appeared to be fully loaded, filled the hollows with police, and then threw a tarpaulin over each. The two lorries then set off to make a large detour in order to approach Bunratty from the south, the opposite direction to Ballybor, and Blake made out that they ought to arrive there about midnight. The four Crosleys waited and followed at a time which would bring them to Bunratty a quarter of an hour after the arrival of the lorries. Joyce's sister's house stood back from the main road about eighty yards, was one-storied, very strongly built, and had a tremendous thatch of straw. To the front there were four small windows, heavily shuttered, and a stout oak door, and at the back only a door of the same kind. At a distance of about thirty yards from the house, a low stone wall ran round the sides and back, enclosing a small cabbage garden and the haggard, which gave excellent cover for the police. The lorry stopped within four hundred yards of the house, and the police quickly and silently surrounded it without raising the alarm. They then waited for the arrival of the Crosleys, when the auxiliaries and the remainder of the police formed a second cordon outside the first one. The leading lorry was now brought into the lane which led up to the house and left there with the acetylene lamps shining full on the front door and windows, and at the same time the lamps of the second lorry were taken to the back of the house and mounted on the wall so that anyone attempting to leave the house by the doors or windows would be in the full glare of the powerful lamps. Approaching the house from a gable end, Blake crawled along the front until he reached the door, on which he hammered with the butt of his revolver, and called on the inmates to surrender, telling them that they were surrounded, and that resistance only meant death. Receiving no answer, he called out if they did not come out at once with their hands up, he would open fire on the house, and for reply there came a volley of bullets through the lower part of the door. He then crawled back to cover and ordered his men to open fire on the front door with a machine gun. 
The concentrated fire of a machine gun will cut a hole through a 9 inch brick wall in a very short time, and in a few minutes the oak door was in splinters. While the machine gun kept up a continuous fire at the height of a man's chest, four policemen endeavoured to get into the house by crawling up to the door, but when a few feet away two were shot and the remaining two only escaped by rolling to one side. All that the police had to do now, provided that Joyce was in the house, and the resistance offered made this a certainty, was to wait until daylight, when the certain capture of the gunman would only be a question of time. But by now Blake was excited, and remembering how O'Hara had slipped through his hands, he determined to burn the rats out and finish the show. After getting a tin of petrol from one of the cars, he again crawled up to the gable end, set a light to the tin, and flung it on to the thatch, which at once took fire, burning fiercely. Only a few days previously this part of the thatch had been renewed, and as the weather had been fine, it was bone dry. But after a few minutes the fire reached the old and wet thatch, and as there was a gentle breeze blowing from the front, very soon the back of the house was completely hidden by a cloud of smoke. Realizing the mistake he had made, Blake ordered his men to keep up a continuous fire on the back door, and at the same time rushed the machine gun round to that side. But so blinding was the smoke by now that it was impossible to know where the back door was. Hearing shouts from the front, on going there he found a young woman standing in the doorway with her hands up, who told him that all the men in the house were wounded and unable to move. On entering, they found three of Joyce's bodyguard and his brother-in-law lying in pools of blood on the kitchen floor, but not a sign of Joyce or the fourth man. There was still a chance that the missing two might be found wounded outside the back door, which was ajar, but the smoke was still so dense that no one could approach. After a time the smoke abated, and they found the fourth man dead a few yards from the house, but not a sign of Joyce. Again, working on the theory that the gunman would make for his home in the Ballyrick Mountains, which lay to the westward at the back of the house, Blake divided his forces into two, sending each out on a flank in order to get well ahead of the fugitive, and then form a fan-shaped net and beat backwards towards the house. Four miles away to the west was the Owenmore River, which ran northwards through Ballybor, and across the river were two bridges, each about four miles from where they were. The two forces crossed by different bridges, each dropping three men at the bridges, then went on about three miles, and at daybreak started to beat the country back to the bridges. Here they arrived, worn out at ten a.m., and not a sign had anyone seen or heard of Joyce. Sure that Joyce had crossed the river, the police started to beat back again over the ground they had just covered, but by 4 p.m. the men were done in, and Blake had to call them off and return to Ballybor. That night he got out a large-scale ordnance map of the Benratty district, put himself in Joyce's place, and tried to think out his line of escape, presuming that the fugitive had avoided the bridges and swum the river at the nearest point from his sister's house. On crossing the river he would soon come to a thick wood on the slope of a hill through which the railway line to Ballybor ran, and here he decided that Joyce must be hiding. Early the next morning Blake set out with a strong force, and approaching Derry Allen Wood from all four sides at once, spent the rest of the day beating the wood through and through, but without any result, and they came to the conclusion that by now Joyce must have got clear. A week afterwards, when Blake was returning in the dusk from Grouse Lodge Barracks, a man stopped the car on an open stretch of road about a mile outside Ballybor. The man turned out to be the loyal guard of the goods train, and he told Blake that for several days past he had seen the engine driver drop a parcel as the train passed through Derry Allen Wood, and always at the same place, into a patch of briars on the side of the line. Blake's interest in Joyce awoke afresh, but he felt sure that no living being had escaped them on the day when they searched the wood, and they had not been able to find any trace of a hiding place. However, it would be interesting to know what the engine driver dropped when passing through the wood, and by whom it was picked up. The main road from Ballybor to Castleport ran parallel with the railway, skirting the east side of Derry Allen and here, on a pitch-dark winter's night, in torrents of rain, 
Two Crossleys stopped for a couple of minutes while Blake and a party of RIC and cadets dropped out and then drove on again. With great difficulty, the party found their way in the dark to the railway line, where they remained hidden in some laurels until it began to grow light, when they were able to conceal themselves within easy reach of the patch of briars. After hours of weary waiting, the goods train passed down, and the engine driver dropped the parcel into the briars. At once the police forgot hunger and cold in their eagerness to see who would pick up the parcel, but again they were doomed to hours of weary waiting. At last, when the men had nearly reached the limit of their endurance and light was almost gone, they saw a most miserable-looking wild-eyed man crawling painfully towards the patch of briars. When he was within five yards of the parcel, Blake called on him to surrender, and every man covered him with his rifle. Game to the end, though unable to stand on account of a bullet wound in one leg, Joyce drew his pistol and glared defiance at the police, but as he raised himself to fire, a fifteen-stone cadet, who had crept up silently behind him, flung himself on the famous gunman's back, and a long chase was over. Joyce refused to show Blake his hiding place, but afterwards they learnt from the owner of the wood that there was a cave in the middle of the wood, which had been used by robbers over a hundred years ago, the entrance of which was completely covered by thick heather. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The Stranger Within the Gates. After the loss of the American arms, the district of Ballybor remained quiet for some considerable time, so that the hard working farmers in the country and respectable shopkeepers in the town began to hope at last that the trouble was over and that they might be free to carry on their work in peace unfortunately a quiet and peaceful district is anathema to the Sinn Féin ghq and before long a volunteer flying column received orders to operate in the ballybor district with a view to stirring up trouble and bringing the country into line with the south by this time the large moderate element of Sinn Féin, in other words, practically every man who had a stake in the country, substantial farmers with haggards to burn and prosperous shopkeepers with shops to burn, realized that they had backed a losing horse and were prepared to do any mortal thing for peace except help the police. Unfortunately, the farmers' sons and shop boys, who in the usual course of events, but for the war, would have been in the States by now, took quite a different view. Twenty pounds in the pound rates, burnt haggards, and ruined businesses meant nothing to boys who paid no rates, nor owned shops or farms. Up to the winter of 1919, the rebels moved about the country in motors, how, when, and where they liked. Even during the time when every gallon of petrol was being kept for the armies in France, and the Loyalists were only allowed six gallons a month on paper, de Valera and his staff burnt petrol as freely as a Connaught peasant will drink poteen. In connection with this, it would be interesting to know into whose petrol tanks the many thousands of gallons of petrol which was washed up on the western shores of Ireland from torpedoed vessels passed, and the system of collection and distribution. After this winter, when the use of cars for illegal purposes became more and more restricted as the car permit regulations became stricter and more rigidly enforced, the volunteers began to make great use of bicycles, and their flying columns consisted of cyclists only. Orders were issued from GHQ that every volunteer must be able to ride a bicycle, and local commandants were instructed to see that every man in their command had one. During the Mons retreat, the cyclists were invaluable both for fighting small rearguard actions and also for keeping in contact with the enemy. During the present war in Ireland, the explanation of the mysteries of how men can shoot policemen from behind a wall and then disappear into thin air, and of how a column of gunmen can shoot up a train in Kerry on Monday and ambush a police lorry in Clare on Tuesday, is to be found in the intelligent use of the humble pushbike. 
and until the authorities round up every push bike in ireland these mysteries will continue as soon as ghq determined that the ballybor district must be brought into line with the south a small party of gunmen operating at the time many miles to the south received their orders and late that night a silent and ghostly party of cyclists rode into the ballybor district at a certain crossroads they were met by guides and long before daybreak the gunmen were billeted in ones and twos throughout the townland of clunala the following night a meeting of the local volunteers was held in the national school and the leader of the gunmen insisted that a police ambush or an attack on the grouse lodge barracks should take place within the next few nights the general opinion being against an attack on the barracks the field of fire was too good and the black and tans too handy with their rifles it was settled by the gunmen that the police should be ambushed at a favourable spot where the main road from ballybor to castleport passed through a wooded domain the next morning father tom the parish priest was besieged by the young volunteers fathers men who had homes and haggards to burn one and all imploring his reverence to prevent an ambush in the parish and save them from the wrath of the auxiliaries some of them when asked confessed that the gunmen were staying in their houses but that their sons had brought them there without leave and that they were powerless to get rid of them from the beginning of the movement father tom who was young for a parish priest and an ardent Sinn feiner in theory had been one of the leaders in the district and even when burning houses and haggards began to follow murderous ambuscades in far-away county cork as surely as day follows night he still felt a thrill of pride for his countrymen who were giving their all for freedom and became a fiercer Sinn feiner than ever but an ambush and the sequel in his own beloved parish was a very different thing and a calamity to be avoided at all costs his house stood high and would give a splendid view at night of burning houses and haggards and there was obviously no time to lose the next day was sunday and at mass father tom who was a fine preacher thundered forth from the altar a vivid imagination stimulated his eloquence to such a pitch that he reduced most of the older members of his flock to tears he told them that it had come to his ears that certain men in the parish were harboring strangers within their gates and that these strangers had been trying to incite young and innocent boys to murder policemen he then described the result of an ambush how houses were burnt to the ground and women and little children were turned out on the road on a winter's night he did not mention the men knowing that by then they would be up in the mountains and how innocent men were shot in their beds before the eyes of their wives but he said nothing about the widow and orphans of the murdered policeman finally he warned his flock against the strangers who would fade away before the wrath of the soldiers and auxiliaries fell on the parish and commanded that they should be instantly turned out under the direst penalties and with a last curse on the strangers he left the chapel if father tom had thundered from the altar against ambushes many many months before instead of openly encouraging the volunteers the result might have been very different but a leader of men who gives an order to-day and a counter-order to-morrow is rarely obeyed that night it was learnt that a party of military would proceed from castleport to ballybor on wednesday night and it was settled to ambush them at the spot chosen in the domain the gunmen promising that a carload of arms and bombs would arrive in time for the ambush and also a doctor in the clunala district there lived nowadays arara avis in the west of ireland a protestant farmer of the old yeoman type so well known in england and a staunch loyalist to his house there came on that sunday night two of the leading farmers who told him the whole story of the proposed ambush and begged him to warn the police the chapel of clunala stands in the centre of the parish close to a crossroads and on that wednesday morning the inhabitants woke up to find a kilted sentry on guard at the crossroads and before most of them could get out of bed two companies of highlanders guided by blake were hard at work searching every house for strangers 
Blake had brought with him two old regular RIC sergeants, men who had been stationed in the district for years and who knew every man, young and old. But the gunmen had been in trouble before and were not to be caught so easily. They were all young men and clean-shaved, and before the police and Highlanders entered any of their billets, one and all were dressed as women with shawls over their heads, and in one house where two of them had been billeted, the Highlanders found a young woman sitting on a stool by the fire, nursing a baby under her shawl, while another pretty shawled girl was preparing breakfast for the young mother. A big Highlander could not resist giving her a glad eye, little knowing that uh, she was a notorious gunman, and wanted to the tune of a thousand pounds for the brutal murder of a D.I. as he was leaving church. The only result of the raid was the finding of an old shotgun in the bed of the local blacksmith, a man who had always defied the local volunteers and kept a gun for poaching only, and who was taken off to Ballybor Barracks amidst the jeers of everybody. However, in a few days they realized how useful and necessary a person a smith is in a country district, and before the week was out the whole townland was clamoring for the smith's release. However, the raid had good results. The volunteers refused point-blank to carry out the ambush on Wednesday night, though the gunmen stayed until that day, making every endeavor to bring it off. Finding it was useless, they disappeared that night as silently as they had come, promising to return shortly in greater numbers. The whole district heaved a sigh of relief when it was known that there were no longer any strangers within the gates, and settled down to farm and lead the life God meant them to live, and hoped against hope that they might never see a cursed stranger again, be he gunman or auxiliary. Blake let it be known that it was a case of no ambush, no auxiliaries, and every farmer in the district was quite content to keep his side of the bargain. But peace was not yet to be the portion of Punala. Within three weeks of the first gunman leaving, a party of twenty arrived on a wild winter's night, and, as on the former occasion, as silently dispersed to their allotted billets. This time the leader of the gunmen did not ask the local volunteers to help, but ordered them to carry out the ambush in the wooded domain on the main road from Castleport to Ballybor, as previously arranged. The gunmen did not appear during the daytime at all, and had been nearly a week in the district before Father Tom heard of their arrival. Unfortunately, the priest was very ill with influenza at the time, and before he could take any action, the damage was done. As usual, the scene of the ambush was laid with great cleverness. Between the two entrance gates of the domain on the main road there was a sharp rise in the form of an S-bend, with a thick thorn hedge on each side of the middle of this bend. Where the rise was steepest there was a lane leading to the keeper's house about fifty yards from the road, and at the entrance of this lane the gunman laid a mine in the main road to be fired by an electric wire running towards the keeper's house. After laying the mine, they forced the road contractor of that part of the road to cart broken stones and lay them right across the road over the mine, so that all traces of the mine were hidden. The day after the mine had been laid, word came to Clunala that the police had arrested three men in Ballybor during the previous night, and that it was thought that the prisoners would be sent to Castleport that night in a Crosley under a strong police escort. As soon as it was dark, the gunmen, after parking their bicycles in a wood of the domain, collected all the volunteers they could induce or force to accompany them, and made their way across country to the scene of the ambush. The night was unusually fine, with a full moon, and two hours after the volunteers and gunmen had taken up their positions, the peculiar note of a Crosley engine could be distinctly heard approaching at a great pace from the Ballybor direction. The gunman who had laid the mine was a first-class electrician, and as the car tore past the lane there was a blinding flash followed by a terrific roar, and the car seemed to jump clean off the road and then collapse in a burning heap on the road. With the roar of the mine the ambushers opened a heavy fire on the car, but receiving no reply they quickly ceased fire, waiting to see what would happen next. 
but the mine had done its work only too well and the only sounds which could be heard were the groans of dying men amid the burning ruins of the car after some minutes two policemen rolled out of the end of the car and lay on the high road one man with both his legs paralyzed crying piteously for water and the second with part of his head blown away by a flat-nosed bullet crying for a priest up to this point the leader of the gunmen had taken charge of all the proceedings and when the volunteers were collected on the road like a flock of sheep they still waited for orders however after five minutes as no order was given they began to look for their leader suddenly to realize that every gunman had faded away at once every volunteer started to make his way home as fast as he could and within two minutes the only occupants of the road were the two dying policemen lying like two black logs in the white moonlight presently a terror-stricken keeper crept out of his house and as soon as his scattered wits could take in the situation he got out his bicycle and rode into ballybor for help long before day broke columns of soldiers r i c and auxiliaries concentrated on and met at that horrible scene on the road between the two domain gates and shortly afterwards broke like a tornado on the townland of clunalla and father tom from his bedroom window saw his worst fears realized when daylight came the parish was at last clear of all strangers and avengers but at a terrible price a quick-witted policeman remembered that the only limestone road in clunalla was the road from ballybor to castleport so that it was easy to tell in a house by an inspection of boots if any man of that household had been present at the ambush and that night the fathers suffered for the sins of their sons and the sons paid the full price of the gunman's crime like good soldiers the gunmen carefully thought out their line of retreat before the ambush took place they found that a broad river ran through the domain parallel to and about four hundred yards from the main road that the nearest bridges above and below were five miles away and that across the river ran a range of wild and desolate country in a wood on the bank of the river they found fishing boats used for netting salmon during the summer time and before the ambush the leader sent two of his men to collect all these boats at a certain part of the river and to remain there in readiness to take the remainder and their bicycles across as soon as the ambush was over they collected their bicycles crossed the river and were soon riding through a little-known pass in the mountains on their way to carry on their devil's work in a part of the country many miles removed from the scene of the clunala ambush End of chapter seven chapter eight of tales of the royal irish constabulary by unknown this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight mr briggs island several years before the late war there lived in the suburb of london a prosperous stockbroker by name benjamin briggs a lonely bachelor an ardent fisherman and a man of simple and kindly nature every year mr briggs spent his entire summer holidays fishing in scotland or wales and it was not until after hearing a friend at his club recounting the wonderful fishing that he had had in ireland that he turned his attention to that country one afternoon when passing through euston station a famous poster of connemara caught mr briggs's eye and the following summer he made a complete tour of that delightful country of mountains moors and rivers so charmed was he with the scenery and the perfect manners of the peasants that he determined to see more of the country and on a fine summer's afternoon found himself in the little town of ballybor reputed to be one of the best fishing centres in ireland during a walk through the town before dinner he happened to see a large notice in an auctioneer's window offering for sale at what seemed to mr briggs a very low figure a fishing lodge on an island in the middle of a large lake famous for its salmon trout and pike fishing and distant about six miles from the town of ballybor the notice also stated that the auctioneer would be glad to give full particulars and that the lucky buyer could obtain immediate possession 
now many of us have cherished a secret longing to possess an island no doubt an aftermath from reading robinson crusoe when very young possibly in the sea if one has a weakness for that element or if not in the middle of some large lake full of salmon and trout from childhood mr briggs had had two great longings first to be a successful fisherman and secondly to possess an island to which he could eventually retire and fish all day and every day the following morning after an interview with the auctioneer he drove out to the lake on an outside car was duly met by the caretaker pat lyden with a boat fell in love at sight with a comfortable little six-roomed lodge built on the shore of a small green island far out in the lake and commanding glorious views of mountains and water and on his return to ballybor he wasted no time in completing the purchase the following day he moved to the island and spent a happy fortnight fishing with pat lyden before returning to england from the outbreak of war until nineteen twenty mr briggs was unable to visit ireland but during the summer of that year he decided to retire and after disposing of his business and suburban home set out for ballybor meaning to spend the rest of the year fishing on lake moira on a dull morning he landed at kingstown as enthusiastic as a schoolboy on his first sporting trip and longing to see his beloved island once more mr briggs only read one newspaper a paper once famous throughout the world for its impartial and patriotic news and complete freedom from party taint and he had not the remotest idea that the ireland of nineteen fourteen and the ireland of nineteen twenty were two very different countries but so simple was the little man's nature that he did not realize the state of the country until he reached a small junction about sixteen miles from ballybor and where he had to change here he had some time to wait and while walking up and down the platform a long-haired wild-eyed stranger sidled up to him and asked if he was mr briggs and on learning that he was the stranger advised him to return to england at once as the air on loch moira was very unhealthy at present this greatly disturbed mr briggs but he determined to take no notice of the mysterious warning and taking his seat in the train began to read his papers again shortly before the train was due to start a small party of british soldiers under an n c o marched on to the platform and proceeded to take their seats in a third-class carriage at once the engine driver fireman and guard packed up their kits and prepared to leave the station the station master did his best to induce them to take the train on to ballybor but not one yard would they go as long as a british soldier remained in the train and in the end they marched out of the station amid the laughter of the soldiers who continued to keep their seats the civilian passengers now left the train and mr briggs found himself dumped with all his kit on the platform for some time he sat there feeling sure that in the end the train would start but after two hours he gave it up and wired to a garage in ballybor for a car to be sent to the junction after a further wait of three hours a car turned up and late that evening mr briggs arrived at the hotel at ballybor weary and quite bewildered he seemed to have wandered into a south american republic instead of into the old and pleasant ireland after breakfast the next morning he determined to call on his old friend the d i before leaving for the lake but he hardly recognized the police barracks which had been transformed from a homely whitewashed house into a sand-bagged and steel-shuttered fort here he found that his old friend had retired on pension and in his stead reigned a young and soldier-like d i with a row of orders and war ribbons on his breast mr briggs introduced himself but found that neither the d i nor the head constable had ever heard of either mr briggs or his island but they told him that only the previous day a police lorry had been ambushed on the road to the lake and advised him to return to england however having got so far mr briggs determined to see his island come what might and after a lot of difficulty and at a very high price a driver was at last found with sufficient courage to drive him out to the place where lyden was to meet him 
Lydon was a typical western peasant, and on former visits Mr. Briggs had asked no better amusement than to listen to his quaint remarks and stories for hours on end whilst fishing. But like the rest of the people, he now seemed a different being. During the row out to the island he did not utter a dozen words, and long before they landed on the little stone quay Mr. Briggs had ceased to ask the man any questions. After his long absence the island appeared more enchanting than ever, and from the kitchen chimney he could see the blue turf smoke rising in the still summer's air, reminding him of Mrs. Lydon's good cooking. On approaching the house he was startled to hear loud talking and laughter in the dining-room, and on entering found the room full of strangers eating a hearty meal. At the head of the table sat a soldierly-looking man, who wished Mr. Briggs good day, and asked who the devil he might be. On first hearing the voices, Mr. Briggs had jumped to the natural conclusion that a fishing party had landed and asked Mrs. Lydon to give them something to eat, and he was prepared to welcome them as became a host but to be asked who the devil he might be in his own house was the last straw of the nightmare and transformed him from a mild english gentleman into a foaming fury however the only effect on the strangers of mr briggs's rage was to move them to greater mirth and as he rushed out of the room he heard one man saying that they must have sent them a lunatic this time in the kitchen he found mrs lydon in tears and explanations soon followed for some time past the island had been used as a Sinn Féin internment camp, and his unbidden guests consisted of a British colonel, two subalterns, a D.I. and a magistrate from a neighboring county, who had given trouble to the volunteers by insisting on holding petty sessions courts in opposition to the newly established Sinn Féin courts. Realizing that he was a prisoner in his own house, he returned to the dining-room, explained this extraordinary situation to his fellow prisoners, and then joined them at their meal. When he had finished, he went for a stroll with the colonel, who explained matters more fully to him. Most of the prisoners had been on the island for some time, and so far had found no chance of attempting to escape. The colonel himself had been captured while salmon fishing on a river in the south, and then brought blindfolded at night in a car to Lough Moira. On inspecting the boathouse, Mr. Briggs found that all his boats had gone, even the one Lydon had rowed him out in, which the colonel told him had been brought over from another island, where their guards lived, and that the guards must have returned in her further that they were visited every second day by these guards who brought them food for which they had to pay a stiff price the colonel had unearthed two packs of patience cards and the three soldiers with the di for a fourth played bridge from after breakfast until they went to bed in the sitting-room there was a small library of mr briggs's favorite books and these kept the rest of the party from drowning themselves in the lake Two days after his arrival, and just as he was thinking about retiring for the night, Lydon came in to say that an officer wished to speak to Mr. Briggs outside, and on following Lydon he found a man dressed in a wonderful green uniform waiting at the front door. The officer informed Mr. Briggs that he had come to take him to a Republican court, which was to be held that night on the mainland, and where the case of the Republic versus Briggs would be heard mr briggs had never heard of such a thing as a republican court but could get no further information from the gentleman in green and shortly afterwards the party set out in a boat for the mainland by the time they landed it was quite dark and after a walk of about twenty minutes they arrived at a large building which mr briggs recognized as clunala chapel and here the officer handed him over to a local publican who told him to follow him into the chapel inside was a large crowd of country people while at one end was a raised table at which were seated the three judges two in civilian attire and the third in the clothes of a priest after his eyes had got accustomed to the poor light of the few oil lamps mr briggs recognized in the presiding judge the parish priest of a neighboring parish and in the other two judges a butcher and a good-for-nothing painter from ballybor at the time of his entry a river fishing rights case was before the court with a ballybor solicitor acting for the defendant while another well-known solicitor from the same town acted as republican prosecutor 
After a time, the case of the Republic versus Briggs came on for hearing, and Mr. Briggs learnt, to his great astonishment, that they proposed to take his island and fishing rights on Lough Moira from him, compulsorily for the sum of two hundred pounds, to be paid in Dialarian bonds, whatever they might be, and that he was to be deported to England as soon as convenient. At the end of the case, the presiding judge asked Mr. Briggs if he had any objection, but he wisely refused to say anything, and shortly afterwards was handed over to the green officer who took him back to the island. A few days after, as Mr. Briggs was sitting disconsolately on a rock at the north end of the island, gazing across the lake and wondering if he would ever fish there again, he heard the distant hum of a motor engine, and in a short time saw a plane approaching the island from the southeast. Wild with excitement, he dashed into the house, calling the colonel to come out at once. The colonel got up from the card table, and on seeing the plane, quickly collected all the sheets and blankets he could find, and hurriedly spread them out in the form of rough letters, spelling the word HELP on the grass in front of the house, and then ran down to the end of the quay, where he waved a sheet frantically over his head. For what seemed an age to the prisoners, the plane took no notice of the colonel's signals. Then, to their great joy, the pilot cut off his engine, dropped to about eight hundred feet, and flew low over the island, turned, flew over the island again, and then made off at full speed in a southerly direction. That night none of the prisoners slept a wink, expecting every minute to hear the sounds of their deliverer's approach. On the return of the plane to the aerodrome, a cipher message was at once dispatched to Blake, with instructions to investigate the trouble on the island. But, as usual, the message was delayed in the post office and received too late to take any action that evening. On inquiry, Blake found that, though formerly two police boats were kept on the lake for the purpose of raiding poteen makers on the islands, some time ago these boats had been burnt and there was no means of getting out to the islands. Early the next morning the police borrowed a motor launch lying in the river at Ballybor and with difficulty mounted it on a commandeered lorry. Taking a strong police force with them, Blake and Jones then set out for the lake, deciding to launch the boat at a bay close to Clunalla Chapel. Here the road ran about fifty yards from the lake, but by the aid of rollers they soon got the launch off the lorry and afloat. Leaving a guard over the cars and lorry, the police then set out for the islands, and all went well until they reached the neck of the bay, which was only about two hundred yards wide. Here they came under heavy rifle fire from the north shore, the attackers being hidden amongst bushes and the ruins of an old cottage. Unfortunately, one of the first shots cut the magneto wire, and the launch at once started to drift helplessly in the wind towards the attackers. While Blake repaired the wire, Jones swept the attackers with a Lewis gun, which quickly smothered their fire, and the wire being soon repaired, the launch got under way again and made for the open lake at full speed. Blake had never been on Lough Moira before, but had brought with him a sergeant who had often taken part in poteen raids on the islands in former days. On looking at an ordnance map, he found that there were two large islands, one with only a fishing lodge marked on it, and the other with seven houses shown, and on the sergeant's advice they made for the latter, on the assumption that something must have gone wrong with their boats and that the people might be short of food. When within about four hundred yards of the island, they again came under rifle fire, and realizing that they had called at the wrong house, and that it would be impossible to effect a landing except at a heavy loss, they changed their course and made for the second island. But before they got halfway, a boat put out from the first island and made off in the direction of the far shore. The launch was fairly fast, and in a very short time they were within six hundred yards of the boat, when Blake fired a single shot as a signal to it to stop. In reply, the boat opened fire on the launch, but one short burst of Lewis gun fire quickly brought them to their senses, and the occupants put up their hands. After disarming these men, Blake took their boat in tow, and this time succeeded in reaching Mr. Briggs Island safely, where he was astonished to meet the prisoners on the quay, and more especially the D.I., who had been missing for some time, and of whom all hope had been given up. 
the whole party then set off for the mainland found that the guard had successfully beaten off an attack on the cars and eventually all returned safely to ballybor with only two constables slightly wounded two days afterwards mr briggs embarked on the s s cockatoo bound for england where he will probably remain until the war in ireland is over End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Reward of Loyalty. For some time after the death of Anthony Maine, the murdered R.M., Petty Sessions Court ceased to be held in Ballybor, and the Sinn Fein Courts reigned supreme. At length, Maine's successor arrived and endeavored to start the courts in his district again but found that not only were the country people too terrorized to bring any cases before a British court, but that most of the magistrates had resigned, and none of the few remaining ones would face the bench. However, Fitzmaurice, the new R.M., stuck to it, and in the end a retired officer, living just outside Ballybor, became a magistrate for the county, and suddenly, to the intense excitement of the whole town, it was given out that some countrymen had had the audacity to defy the edict of Dial Erinan and to summon a neighbor to appear before the British magistrates. The courthouse at Ballybor is a most curious-looking edifice of an unknown style of architecture, shabby and dismal outside, and like a vault inside. On the day that the court reopened, the place was packed to the doors, and when the clerk stood up to announce the court open and ending with the words, God save the king, the silence could be felt. It was what is known in the west of Ireland as a saft day, a day of heavy drizzling rain and a mild west wind off the Atlantic, and after a time the crowded courthouse of countrymen in soaked homespuns and women with reeking shawls over their heads literally began to steam, and the strong acrid smell of tur smoke from the drying clothes became overpowering. At first all eyes were fixed on the two magistrates sitting on the raised dais at one end of the courthouse, and many, remembering poor Maine's end, wondered how long the two had to live. The R.M., they knew, was well paid by the British government, but the second magistrate's unpaid loyalty must surely be a form of madness, or most likely he received secret pay from the government. After the disposal of cases brought by the police for various offences, the only civil case on the list, in reality the beginning of a trial of strength between Sinn Féin and the British government, came on for hearing, and in due course the magistrates gave a decision in favor of the complainant, a herd by name Mickey Coleman. Taking advantage of the suspension of the law, a neighbor, Ned Foley, had thought to get free grazing, and day after day had deliberately driven his cattle onto Coleman's land. Coleman, having remonstrated repeatedly with Foley in vain, consulted a Ballybor solicitor who advised him to bring Foley into a Sinn Féin court, where, he assured him, he would get full justice. This Coleman refused to do, and after consulting a second solicitor, brought the case before the Ballybor Petty Sessions Court. Coleman appears to have been a man of great determination and courage, as he had been repeatedly warned by the volunteers that if he persisted in taking Foley into a British court, they would make his life a hell on earth and as he left the court after winning his case a note was slipped into his hand to the effect that the ira neither forgets nor forgives coleman had started life as a farm laborer eventually becoming heard to a loyalist called vivian carew whose ancestors came over to ireland in the time of queen elizabeth and who lived alone in a large house about eight miles from ballybor where he farmed his own domain of four hundred irish acres Carew belonged to a class of Irishmen fast dying out in the West, and considering that it has always been the policy of every liberal government to throw them to the wolves, it is almost beyond belief that any are left in the country. A type of man any country can ill afford to lose, and all countries ought to be proud and glad to gain. After serving throughout the late war in the British Army, Carew had returned home, hoping to live in peace and quiet for the rest of his days but had soon been undeceived. 
though working himself as hard as any small farmer and farming his land far better than any other man in the district it was decided by men who coveted his acres that he possessed too many and the usual steps in the west were taken to make him give up three of his four hundred acres and if possible force him to sell out all coleman started with a heavy heart for his cottage in rossbane carew's domain and from the moment he left the courthouse until he lifted the latch of his door found himself treated as a leper by townsfolk and country people alike probably some of the people would have been willing to speak to him and most likely many admired his pluck but a man who comes under the curse of the i r a is to be avoided at any costs no man can tell when that sinister curse which is often a matter of life and death to a peasant may be extended to any unwary sympathizer in the evening when going round the cattle he met his master who on being shown the threatening note at once wanted coleman to bring his family up to the big house but he refused knowing that if he did his cottage would probably be burnt and his own few cattle either stolen or maimed soon after eleven that night there came a loud knock at the door and coleman who had been sitting by the fire expecting a visit rose up to meet his fate but was caught by his terrified wife who clung to him with the strength of despair at last coleman succeeded in opening the door and to their utter astonishment in walked a british officer dressed in khaki topcoat steel helmet and with a belt and holster the officer explained that he came from castleport that he had a large party of soldiers on the road outside and that he was going to scour the countryside for rebels that night lastly he said that he had been told coleman was well disposed and would he help him by giving information coleman who at the sight of a british officer in a steel helmet when he expected a volunteer with a black mask had been overcome with joy at the mention of that sinister word information regained his senses and answered that he had none to give that he was only a poor herd striving to do his work and keep a wife and a long weak family and that he had nothing to do with politics the officer said nothing but sat down by the fire on a stool and started to play with the children presently he returned to the charge again and asked the herd where the foley's lived and if they were volunteers the mention of the name of foley confirmed coleman in his growing suspicion and he replied that he knew the foley's for quiet decent boys and he believed that they had nothing at all to do with politics shortly afterwards the officer wished them good night leaving coleman and his wife a prey to conflicting emotions if he really was a british officer then at any rate they were safe for that night but if not then probably some terrible outrage was brewing only a week before the volunteers had set fire while the inmates were in bed to the house of a farmer who had bought the farm a few days previously at a public auction contrary to the orders of the i r a and though the inmates just managed to escape in their night attire their two horses and a cow were burnt to death and their charred bodies could still be seen lying amid the ruins from the main road a warning to all who thought of disobeying the i r a after the time it would take to walk to the foley's house and back there came a second knock and the officer entered again pushing one of the young foley's in front of him with his hands up here's the young blighter said the officer to coleman and if you will give the necessary information about him i'll have him shot by my men outside at once but coleman whose suspicion by now was a certainty refused to be drawn and replied that he knew nothing against the foley's and that they were quiet respectable neighbors for some time the officer tried his best to get coleman to give evidence against foley but at last finding it was useless left taking his prisoner with him by now the colemans were too unhappy to go to bed and sat round the fire in silence after an hour there came a third knock and again the officer appeared but this time coleman could see quite a different expression on his face and in a brutal voice not taking the trouble to hide his brogue he bade the unfortunate herd get up out of that and come outside coleman followed his tormentor outside and there found a mob of young men and boys waiting for him who proceeded to kick him along the road for a mile when he could go no farther and fell on the road they then tied his hands and ankles and left him in the middle of the road for a police car to run over him and here he lay all night in the rain 
the next day was market day at ballybor and many of the country people started early in their carts for the town and though none drove over the herd yet one and all passed by on the other side luckily when the herd was nearly gone from cold and exposure the good samaritan appeared in the shape of carew driving to ballybor and in a short time he had coleman back at rossbane in front of a big turf fire and after placing him in charge of the cook brought the herd's family to a cottage in the yard and then drove into ballybor to see blake but the di had his hands too full to be able to give protection to individuals at this time next to sinn fein the transport union was the strongest party in the west and being composed of landless men its main object was to gain land for its members and by all and every means in its power with the result that their attention was concentrated on outing all men with four hundred acres or more in their possession and next would come the men with three hundred acres and so on down the scale the farmer with forty acres or thereabouts the best class of small farmer in the west and if let alone the most law-abiding as they were numerous and possessed something worth holding on to soon realized where this would lead to and tried to apply the brakes they would have succeeded but for their younger sons who in the ordinary course of events would have found good employment in the states but under present circumstances have to remain at home helping to make small fortunes for their parents it is this class of young men who with the shop boys form the rank and file of the i r a and in the case of the farmer's sons it is the western peasant's usual characteristic of land hunger which forms the chief driving power at one period it looked as though sinn fein and the transport union would come to loggerheads but sinn fein proved too strong and the two became partners to all intents and purposes a few days after he had returned from his fruitless visit to blake carew received a letter from the secretary of the local branch of the transport union calling upon him to dismiss coleman and that if he did not comply at once the union would call out all his men carew ignored the letter and the threat the owenmore river runs through rossbane roughly dividing it into two equal parts and after a fortnight carew received a letter from the i r a calling upon him to attend a sinn fein court the following sunday night at clunala chapel and saying that the part of his domain separated from the house by the river was to be taken from him and if he wished to claim compensation he must attend the court and again carew ignored the letter a week afterwards all his farm hands and servants with the exception of the cook katie brogan simply vanished and carew found himself with only katie and coleman to keep going a large house and a four hundred acre farm nothing daunted he took the colemans into the house made mrs coleman cook and katie housemaid whilst coleman and he determined to carry on with the farming as best they could a few days after a little girl brought a message that katie's father was very ill and that her mother wished her to go home at once so katie left immediately and the following day carew rode over to see if he could help the brogans knowing that they were miserably poor the brogans lived in a two-roomed hovel on the verge of a bog and on entering a terrible sight met carew's eyes the old man lay dead in one bed katie dead in the second bed with a large bullet hole through her forehead and the old mother crooning over the fire ashes stark mad he then tried to find out what had happened from two neighboring cottages but in each case the door was slammed in his face with a curse of fear after wandering about for over an hour he met a small boy who told him the details of the worst murder the country had yet seen it appeared that katie must have written to the police in ballybor with reference to the treatment of the colemans and that the letter had fallen into the hands of sinn fein agents in the post office using old brogan's illness to decoy katie home the murderers waited until midnight when they knocked at the door at the time katie was sitting by the fire making broth for her father and at once opened the door to be confronted by eight armed men wearing white masks and black hats one of whom said come with us apparently katie refused whereupon they seized her bound her wrists and dragged her screaming and struggling to a field some hundred yards from her home 
Here they tried her by court-martial, convicted her, and no time was lost by the assassins in carrying out the death sentence. They then flung her body outside the cottage where it was found by her mother, whose cries brought old Brogan out of his bed, and between them they managed to carry their murdered daughter in. The shock was too much for the old man, and he died shortly after he returned to bed, which finally turned the old woman's brain. Then followed weeks of misery. Every night Carew's cattle were driven, his gates taken off their hinges and flung into the river, trees were cut down, fences smashed, and the showing of a light at any window was the signal for a volley of shots. Life in the trenches on the western front was often fearful enough, but to realize the life Carew and his herd led at this time, one must remember that they had to carry on week in, week out, with no rest billets ever to retire to, apart from the fact that at any moment sudden death in some horrible mutilating form might be their lot. The first fair at which Carew tried to sell cattle warmed him of the futility of attending any more. Sinn Féin policemen, with green, white, and yellow brassards on their arms, took care that no buyers came near him, while all the corner boys at Ballybor amused themselves by driving his cattle backwards and forwards through the fair until they could hardly move. Directly Carew would make for one set of tormentors, a fresh lot would appear behind his back and take up the chase. After starting Coleman on his way home with the weary cattle, he went to the grocer he had dealt with for years, meaning to lay in a good stock of provisions. On entering the shop, the owner took Carew into a private room and explained that if he sold one pennyworth of food to him, his shop would be burnt over his head that night, and that all the shopkeepers had received the same orders from the IRA. Carew then went straight to the police barracks, where the police soon bought all that he required. It was nearly dark when Carew drew near to his entrance gate, and as his horse started to walk, four men darted out from the shadow of the domain wall, two seizing the horse, while the rest, covering him with shotguns, ordered him to get out. Carew had no alternative but to comply, whereupon his captors led him down a lane towards the river, where they were joined by a crowd of men and boys. On reaching the river a violent argument started, one section being for drowning him out of face, while another wished to give him a chance of his life if he would swear to give up his land. In the end they compromised, and two tall men took Carew by the arms and waded out into the river with him until they were over their waists. The leader then called out to Carew that if he would not agree to surrender all his lands and promise to leave the country, they would drown him there and then. In order to gain time, Carew pretended to be greatly frightened and started a whining altercation with the leader on the bank. As he expected, his would-be executioners soon joined in heatedly, so much so that shortly one let go of his arm, and throwing the other off his balance with a quick wrench, Carew dived, and swimming down and across the river under water, was soon in safety on the far bank. As soon as the crowd realized that their prisoner had escaped, they opened fire on the river at once, hitting one of the men in the water, whereupon the wounded man's friends turned on another faction, and a free fight ensued. Once across the river, Carew ran as hard as he could for the house of a friendly farmer living on the main road on the east side of the river, borrowed a bicycle from the man, and set off for Ballybor. By great good luck, as Carew reached the barracks at Ballybor, he found Blake on the point of setting out on a night expedition with a Crosley load of police. On hearing his story, Blake at once agreed to return with him, in the hope that they might be in time to save Rossbane. In order to surprise the volunteers, Blake went by the road on the east side of the river, and on reaching Carew's domain, hid the car inside in the shadow of some trees. Carew then swam the river, brought back a boat, and ferried the police across in three parties. The farm buildings and main yard of Rossbane lie between the house and the river, and on entering the yard the police found Coleman lying insensible and surrounded by his weeping wife and children. Learning from the woman that the volunteers were on the point of setting fire to the house, the police, led by Blake and Carew, who was armed with rifle and revolver, and by now in a white heat of fury, made for the house in two parties, one under Carew for the front entrance, and the other under Blake for the back. 
the last thing the volunteers expected was a brutal assault by the police and after eating and drinking all they could find and looting what happened to take their fancy they had just sprayed petrol over the hall and set it on fire when the police entered it is not often that the irc have the pleasure of coming to grips with the elusive ira but when they do they put paid in capital letters to the accounts of their murdered comrades men shot in cold blood in their homes or dragged unarmed out of trains and butchered like cattle the ric are probably one of the finest fighting forces to be found in a continent where at the present day practically every man is trained to arms and most people have seen the fight cornered rats will put up. The main hall of Rossbane was in the center of the house, and after setting fire to it, the volunteers had started to leave, some by the front door and others through the kitchen, with the result that they ran into the arms of the police, who did not waste time with futile shouts of hands up, but proceeded at once to business. At first they fought in darkness, but soon the flames gathered strength, and their glow silhouetted the forms of the volunteers, giving the police as good targets as man could wish for. In a short time the volunteers broke. Some rushed upstairs, never to be seen alive again, while others fled into the drawing-room which opened off the hall, only to find escape cut off by heavy barred shutters. By now the center of the house was burning fiercely, and all the police had to do to complete the rout was to wait outside the two exits and let the flames act as the part of ferrets. Ten minutes more saw the end, and with it the few volunteers who escaped with their lives, handcuffed together in a miserable group in the big yard, covered by two black and tans and when the captain of the Rossbane Company of the IRA revised his company role, his pen must have been busy with a gone to America after many names. Dawn broke on a sight worthy of modern Russia, on the smoldering ruins of the fine old house, on the wretched groups of singed and blackened volunteers, and on the group of still weeping Colemans huddled in a corner of the yard as far from the fire of the volunteers as they could get carew still undaunted though wounded in a leg and shoulder and soaked to the skin for hours wished to stay on in the cottage in the yard but as soon as the fight was over blake had sent half his force back to ballybor in the crosley to bring out more transport and the argument was settled by the arrival of two crosleys and three fords in which blake returned to barracks taking carew and the colemans with him as well as the prisoners it was impossible to leave any police at rossbane the wounded had to be attended to and blake rightly guessed that the volunteers had had a dose that night that would keep them quiet for some time to come carew's wounds were only slight and the following day he was determined to return to rossbane poor coleman had no option but to go with his master having no money a family to provide for and knowing full well that he might as well ask for the crown of england as seek employment elsewhere in the west while immigration to the states was out of the question blake was now in an awkward dilemma unable to give carew protection he feared that if he returned the chances were that both he and the herd would be murdered however carew was determined to go so blake gave out on the quiet that if anything happened to either of them the auxiliaries would be called in and let him go for some time carew lived in peace the fight at the burning of rossbane had put the fear of god into the local volunteers and most of them would as soon have faced a lewis gun as face carew in a fighting mad temper while the threat of the auxiliaries stayed the hands of the shoot him from behind a wall brigade at length carew went up to dublin to find out about the payment of his malicious injury claim for the burning of rossbane and on his return was met at ballybor station by blake with the news that some i r a flying column had beaten coleman to death and burnt all the outbuildings at rossbane not leaving a wall standing carew wished now to put up a wooden hut at rossbane and endeavor to carry on alone but blake refused to let him go and in the end he was persuaded greatly against his will to sell his lands by public auction the auction took place at ballybor the lands being divided into lots of a suitable size to suit small farmers but the auctioneers did not receive a single bid the i r a saw to that 
Carew now determined to leave his lands waste, his home in ruins, and as soon as he received the money for his malicious injury claim, to go to British East Africa, there to await the return of better days in Ireland, when he intends to return and rebuild the home of his fathers. Will they ever come? End of chapter 9《Chapter X of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter X — Poteen There are very few industries in the west of Ireland, and of these by far the most lucrative is the distillation of illicit whisky, or, as it is generally called by the peasants, poteen. The average countryman would far rather make a fiver by sticking a stranger with a horse than a hundred pounds by hard, honest work. Add an element of danger, and he is quite content. The making of poteen combines much profit with little labor, and a good element of danger, in that the distiller may be caught by the police and heavily fined. The beginning of poteen is lost in the mist of past ages, and the end will probably synchronize with the end of Ireland. The amount made varies with the demand, and the demand fluctuates with the price and supply of whiskey. During 1919, when whiskey became weak, dear, and scarce, and the police for a time practically ceased to function, the call for poteen became so great that the demand far exceeded the supply, and for many months the whiskey sold in the majority of public houses throughout the West was made up of a mixture of three-quarters poteen and a quarter of whiskey. At the beginning of the last century all poteen was made from malt in the same way as whiskey is made, until some thoughtful man argued that if they could make beer from sugar in England, we could surely make poteen from the same material in Ireland. And as anyone buying malt or growing barley was liable to attract the eye of the RIC, all poteen ceased to be made from malt, and the far simpler method of distilling from treacle continues to this day. Treacle is largely imported in barrels to Ireland, ostensibly for the purpose of fattening cattle and pigs. In the early part of 1919, a young Welshman, David Evans, was demobilized with a good gratuity, and being a keen fisherman, determined he would have one good summer salmon fishing in Scotland before settling down to work. But Evans was not the only man looking out for salmon fishing in Scotland, and he soon realized that that country was out of the question. During the war, Evans had served at one time in the same division with Blake, and thinking that the latter might know of some good salmon fishing at a moderate rent, he wrote to him. By return of post came an answer from Blake, saying that, owing to the bad state of the country, very few Englishmen had taken fishing in Ireland that season, and that there was a very good stretch of the Owenmore River, about ten miles above Ballybor, to let at a moderate rent. Evans at once wired asking Blake to take the fishing for him, and ten days afterwards took up his quarters at Cara Lodge, a small fishing lodge on the bank of the river. Ireland has probably benefited more than any other country in Europe by the war, and not least by the submarine scourge, which not only raised the prices of cattle and pigs beyond the dreams of avarice, but also increased the number of salmon in Irish rivers to an extent unknown within the memory of man. Before the war, salmon and sea trout in many western rivers were rapidly becoming exterminated through the great increase of drift nets at sea, but directly the first German submarine was reported to have been seen off the west coast, not a fisherman would leave land, with the result that the fish had free ingress to their native rivers, and the numbers of spawning fish were greatly increased. Evans had great sport, thoroughly enjoyed himself, and found the peasants quite the most charming and amusing people he had ever met. No matter what sort of house he entered, he was received like a prince, and bid ten thousand welcomes. A carefully dusted chair would be placed by the fireside for his honor, and a large jar of poteen produced from under the bed. Towards the end of his time at Cara Lodge, Evans came to the conclusion that if he could only discover some way of making a decent income, he would settle down in the west of Ireland. But the question of how to make money puzzled him greatly. Farming did not appeal to him, and beyond that there did not appear to be any other industry open to an enterprising young man, and any profession was ruled out owing to the long period of training required. 
Before the war, Evans had worked for a short time in a distillery and had a good idea of how to make whiskey and of malting. But to start a distillery in the Ballybor district was out of the question, owing to the smallness of his capital. But if he could not make whiskey, he could make poteen with a very small outlay. On making inquiries, he found that the possibilities of the idea were enormous. The outlay was small, the returns great, but the risks were also great. Yet, if detection could be avoided, the returns would only be limited by the amount of treacle and malt available. At this period, the country people were full of money, and as whiskey was almost unattainable, they were prepared to pay a very high price for poteen, and the distilleries were rapidly making fortunes. Still, there was considerable danger attached to the trade. The police, though hardly ever seen outside their barracks except in large numbers, occasionally carried out extensive poteen raids, and as it was nearly an impossibility to find a house without poteen in it, they never returned empty-handed. Having decided to go into the poteen trade, the next question was where to make it. To start distilling in a small way in a small house merely meant certain discovery after making small profits, and Evans knew that once he was caught red-handed by the police, the game would be up. During bad times in any country, when the honest but timid men go to the wall, the unscrupulous but bold men come into their own, and often make a fortune by means which in quieter times would be out of the question. Evans belonged to the latter class. Towards the end of 1919, the peasants started to burn unoccupied country houses throughout the South and West. Doubtless they were often burnt by wild young men without rhyme or reason, but also probably with the idea of making it impossible for the owners to return to their homes, and so force them to sell their domain lands to the very people who had burnt their houses. A few miles from Kara Lodge, at the foot of the mountain, stood one of the largest houses in Connaught. Ardcumber House, the family seat of one of the oldest Elizabethan families in Ireland, and probably the finest sporting domain in the West. The great house, full of Sheraton and Chippendale furniture, commanded wonderful views of mountains and moors, while in front runs the Owenmore River, famous for its salmon fishing, through a valley which in winter time can show more snipe, duck, geese, and wild game of all sorts than any other valley of its size in the British Isles. One would have thought that the above sporting attractions would have satisfied any man, but the owner was one of those queer Irishmen who preferred any country to his own, and divided his time between London and continental watering places, leaving the management of his estates to an agent who lived in Ballybor. When reading The Field one evening, Evans came across an advertisement of Ardcumber House to let to a careful tenant at a nominal rent realizing that the agent feared the house would be burnt if left empty he drove into ballybor the following day took blake with him to interview the agent and drove home with the lease of ardcumber house in his pocket at a rent which the sale of game and salmon would cover twice over the best of the fishing being now over evans crossed to england nominally to collect his kit in reality to have a large still made which he had packed in large cases labelled furniture and brought over by long sea to ballybor at the same time he arranged with a sugar agent in england to ship treacle and paraffin barrels to ballyrick and ballybor as he required it when at home in wales he induced a cousin john evans to join him and the two set out for ireland in dublin they purchased a ford truck which they had fitted up as a shooting wagonette with a hood like a box-car and in this after obtaining the necessary police permit through blake they drove straight down to the west and took up their quarters at ardcumber they found the house in charge of an old woman who lived in one of the gate lodges and arranged with her to cook for them and look after the few rooms they used allowing her to go home every evening at six o'clock at the top of the house they found six large rooms shut off from the rest of the house by a heavy door at the head of the stairs. Here they erected the still, using a fireplace as a flue. In a second room they erected wooden fomenting vessels, and in a third stored the treacle and poteen. In order to obtain a supply of water, they fitted a pipe to the main water supply tank, which was in the roof above the attics they now settled down to a regular routine of shooting by day and distilling for a greater part of the night living entirely to themselves 
Once a week they drove to Ballybor in the fort to obtain provisions. Whenever they learnt that a consignment of treacle had reached Ballybor or Ballyrick, they at once removed it in the ford, stored it in the stables, which they kept carefully locked, and carried the treacle in large pails at night-time to the fermenting vessels in the attics. At this time, so occupied were the police with looking after themselves, and the country people with keeping clear of the R.I.C. and the volunteers, that nobody gave a thought to the two queer foreigners above in the big house, who were mad on shooting. As soon as they had accumulated a good supply of poteen, the Irish peasant has no fancy ideas about allowing poteen to mature, and will as soon drink it hot from the still as not. They began to think of how to dispose of it without calling unnecessary attention to themselves. In the end, they decided not to try distributing the poteen themselves, but to find a reliable agent who had a good knowledge of the locality. Even when he was very poor indeed, the western peasant always insisted on having the best of tea, or perhaps it would be more correct to say that he insisted on paying a high price at one time so great were the profits on tea that merchants used to send carts through the country district selling nothing but tea called by the country people tay carts david evans found out that the principal tea merchant for the ballybor district in fact for many miles around was a grocer called terence o'dowd who kept a large shop in ballybor and had a branch in ballyrick hearing that o'dowd was fond of coursing evans called at his shop and after buying a quantity of provisions invited the man to bring his hounds out to ardcumber the following sunday for some coursing after the coursing they took o'dowd into their confidence showed him the distillery and arranged that he should act as their agent this part was simple but the difficulty was how when and where to deliver the goods to o'dowd if the tay-cards came to ardcumber or the distillery ford went to o'dowd's continually suspicion would be aroused after a long discussion they decided on a plan of action once a week when evans drove into ballybor for provisions he was to fill up the ford with poteen and leave the car in a shed in o'dowd's yard where the poteen could be transferred to o'dowd's cellars and the car loaded up with empties o'dowd wanted to use earthenware jars but evans decided on two-gallon petrol tins as being less likely to excite suspicion for a considerable time the plan worked well evans took a full load weekly to o'dowd's whose tea carts distributed the poteen far and wide throughout the district one morning blake who had spent a busy night raiding in a district for arms and poteen stills called in at ardcumber on his way home and had breakfast with the evans during the conversation he mentioned casually that the country was flooded with poteen and that they had failed to find out where it was being made but that they suspected it was being delivered in tea carts from ballybor as soon as blake had gone david drove off into ballybor settled up his accounts with o'dowd who was only too thankful to be rid of the job in time and before he left for home had arranged with an egg merchant called michael flanagan who sent lorries out to all the villages for miles around collecting eggs to take over the agency the petrol tins to be hidden in the straw of the empty egg crates the police appear to have had no suspicion of evans and the probabilities are that the ardcumber distillery would have worked on indefinitely but for interference from a quite unsuspected quarter the sinn fein leaders of the district began to grow uneasy at the effects of the apparently unlimited supply of poteen on the discipline of the volunteers and determined to put down the industry any man who were now found with stills in their possession by the sinn fein police were paraded before the congregation outside the chapels after mass on sunday morning the stills broken up with hammers the owners heavily fined and then let go with a warning of much severer penalties if they were found guilty of the same offence again afterwards evans and flanagan received summonses to appear on a named date before a sinn fein court flanagan went and was heavily fined but evans took no notice of the summons flanagan was now of course afraid to act as agent and the question again arose of how they were to get the poteen to the different buyers while matters were in this state flanagan sent a warning to evans that the volunteers would raid ardcumber on a certain night and that the results would be very unpleasant for them 
The situation was now serious. It was impossible for two men to defend such a large house, and once inside, the Volunteers, apart from the fact that they would probably shoot them, would certainly break up the distillery, and the rapid increase of their bank balances would cease. That evening they received a letter stating that they had been banished from Ireland by an order of the Sinn Féin court, and giving them two days in which to leave the country. The same night, after dark, a volley of shots was fired through the window of every room, showing a light, and the following morning they had to cook their own breakfast, as the old woman did not turn up. But David Evans was not beaten yet. After breakfast he motored into Ballybor, where he waited until it was dark. He then went to the barracks and told Blake that the volunteers had threatened to raid Ardcumber the following night for arms, and suggested that the police should ambush the volunteers in the grounds. Blake, only too glad to help a friend, and eager to get the volunteers together in the open, consented, and before Evans left the two had thought out a very pretty trap. It has been mentioned that Ardcumber stood at the foot of a range of mountains which isolated the Ballybor country on the east, and across them for many miles there was only one track which led down to the back of the domain, and which was never used except by country people bringing turf in creels on donkeys from the mountain bogs during the daytime. Blake proposed to start out the following afternoon with a good force cross the mountains by the main road, which ran through the pass east of Ballybor, and return by the mountain track, reaching Ardcumber Domain soon after dark. Here David Evans was to meet them and guide them to the scene of the ambush. The district between the Domain and the mountains was thinly populated, and at that hour no one would be abroad for fear of the black and tans. The attackers would be certain to come from the opposite direction, and would not be likely to arrive before the moon rose at 11 p.m. The police, with a party of cadets and two Lewis guns, were in position by 9 p.m. in a shrubbery on each side of the avenue, about a hundred yards from the house. At 11.30 p.m., the volunteers, sure of their prey, marched up the avenue in column of route, singing the soldier's song. When they were within forty yards, Blake called on them to halt, lay down their arms, and put up their hands. The column halted at once, and for a second appeared to waver, but an officer gave the order to deploy. Before the column could break up, both Lewis guns opened fire. Unfortunately, at this moment, a dark cloud obscured the moon, and heavy rain began to fall, with the result that, after the first short burst of fire, the volunteers were invisible and though the police started in pursuit, they failed to overtake the flying rebels, and had to concentrate on the house. After collecting and rendering first aid to the wounded, there were none killed, the police brought their cars up to the house, and shortly afterwards returned to Ballybor. The Evanses were now fairly safe from the volunteers, but again the question of distributing the poteen arose, and this time it looked as though they would have to do it themselves. They tried to induce Flanagan to come on again, but the egg merchant was by now thoroughly frightened, and thankful to get off with a heavy fine. O'Dowd, being a police suspect, was out of the question, but there still remained His Majesty's mails. The story of how the Evanses had played the police off against the volunteers was soon the talk of the countryside for many a mile, and so queer and uncertain is the Irish peasant's mentality that, where one would have expected them to be furious and determined to be avenged, on the contrary their great sense of humour was immensely tickled at the idea of the police defending the Ardcumber distillery, and the Evanses became popular heroes. After the volunteer attack, Blake, being afraid that they might make another attempt to capture the arms at Ardcumber House, offered David a party of black and tans for protection, but this offer was refused. For some time His Majesty's mail cars carried the Ardcumber poteen punctually and efficiently, in fact far better than either O'Dowd or Flanagan had done. Petrol tins were still used to put the poteen in, and Evans would leave the full tins at a garage twice a week where the mail cars got their petrol from, and if a mail car carried a few extra tins of petrol, who thought anything about it? Unfortunately, the mail contract for that district ran out a few months afterwards, and this time was given to a man from the north, an orange man, and once again Evans had to find a fresh way of sending round the country his now-famous poteen. 
but so popular had the Evanses become that instead of having to seek agents they received offers to deliver the poteen from the manager of a creamery on the Clunala district and also from the manager of a cooperative society in a village distant about four miles from Ardcumber. Evans closed with both offers, and the cousins redoubled their efforts to turn out all the poteen they possibly could, knowing that an end must come sooner or later. Two months afterwards the auxiliaries discovered that the creamery was being used as a Sinn Féin prison, and as a result raided the place one night and burnt it to the ground. Incidentally, they found several full petrol tins in the manager's office, filled up their petrol tanks with them, and could not make out why the cars would not start it is both possible and probable that except for some unforeseen accident the evanses might have gone on making and selling poteen for an indefinite time in fact as long as the country remained in the present state of chaos the distillation of poteen always has and always will appeal to the western peasant and the story of how the evanses called in the police to defend their still against the attack of the volunteers will be told over the firesides of many a cottage for generations to come long after Sinn Féin is dead and buried. But at last their good luck deserted them. One night, while working at the still, John carelessly knocked over an oil lamp, and in a moment the old dry woodwork of the attic was in flames. Before morning the grand old house, with its great collection of priceless furniture, was a smouldering ruin, nothing but the bare blackened walls standing, and so it is likely to remain for all time. The Evanses, having made a considerable sum of money by now, said good-bye to Blake and returned to their native land. End of chapter 10